All right, so, so today I'm going to talk about a bunch of things. And uh, the basic question is, how does your software-defined radio take a little chunk of spectrum? You know, in our case, it'll be around 915 megahertz to start with, and bring it down, capture everything within that chunk of spectrum, uh, and bring it down to centered around zero hertz. Now, what, what does zero hertz mean? What, is, what does negative frequency mean? And why do you get complex numbers out? That's, that's what I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about. So, so the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to show a lot of, a lot of demos in GNU Radio. Now, let me just pull up the first one here, and then I'll share my screen. And you can, I think I have to share the whole screen in order to see everything. All right, so you can all see this, right? OK, so, um, so let, me, let me go to the small one there. OK. So the first demo is just about sampling. And it's just about what, what do we mean uh, when we sample a signal. And this will be no software-defined radio stuff, no complex stuff, just sampling a signal. So here I have a signal source. Uh, it's, the samples are going to be at 1 megahertz, 1 mega sample per second. That makes it easy to divide by 2 or divide by 10. Um, in all of these blocks without a piece of hardware, you have to throttle it. So I'm just going to throttle it to 1 megahertz. And then almost every signal I'm going to look at is going to have both a oscilloscope time trace and a frequency trace. So let me just play this and show you, show you what this looks like. All right, so um, somebody verified that they can see the sine wave and the. Uh... You got it. OK, great. And I've, I've shown the samples in little dots. And I can change the, the frequency of my sine wave to be higher or lower. And you can see if it's not a perfect integer uh, divisor of a megahertz, the samples don't happen at exactly the same point in the sine wave. That's fine. And, and here is the frequency spectrum. So this is the, the Fourier transform of this sine wave will be a single spike at a single frequency. So if I, if I set this to be 100, uh, 100 kilohertz, that should be a tenth of a megahertz, 0.1 megahertz. And you see a little spike right there. And when we talk about sampling, as long as it's slow and you have a lot of samples, the wave looks pretty good. But as you start to get faster and faster, it starts to get a little bit pointy. And when you get really fast, it really doesn't look that great. But the frequency spectrum is still a nice single spike. And as you get faster and faster and faster, um, the samples themselves look worse and worse and worse. And connecting the dots like this looks worse and worse. But this complicated looking thing is still a single spike in frequency. And let me, let me spend a few words explaining what we mean by that and sort of how fast we can push it. So I can push it all the way up to basically half of a megahertz here, where, uh, where it looks like you got up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down samples. That's the maximum I can, I can have, right? The, fast, the samples can't get faster than up, then down, then up, then down. Um, and if I try to put in a faster signal, it actually starts to look like a slower signal. And so whenever we have a sampled signal, there's a maximum frequency that we can tolerate, which is half of, half of the, the sample rate. And let me show you that even though, you know, even though we're not anywhere near there, and these waves look kind of crappy, let me show you how you can recover really good looking waves. And this is what a digital to analog converter does. So let me enable a couple blocks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to repeat each sample 10 times. And then I'm going to show you what that looks like. So when I repeat each sample 10 times, um, I'm showing 10 times as many samples here. It's taking the same amount of time because my sample rate has gone up by a factor of 10. But now you see these little stair steps in the samples. And as I go up and down uh, in frequency, you can see that uh, now you see little stair steps. Now, what's interesting to look at here is the stair steps don't look super great when I get to high frequencies. Uh, but when I look at the frequency plot, now the, the span of this is 10 times as, uh, 100 times as big. Uh, what did I do here? I'm a little confused. I think I, I, think I have a, a math error. Let me just see. Sample rate. Oh, 50, 
Uh, let me see here. Sample rate times repeat. Uh, oh. oh, sample rate times repeat, I should say. I found a bug. All right. Um, Okay, so that, that just tells it the, the maximum scale here. So the scale should be 10 times as big. Because we're sampling 10 times faster, we can go out to signals of 10 times as high frequency. And what you see here is, let me put it at, say, uh, 200 kilohertz, 0.2 megahertz. You can see that there is a spike here at the frequency we want. And there's all these other spikes here. And let me show you that if we filter out all these other spikes, uh, because the stair steppy thing gives us not just the, the fundamental here that we care about, but all these higher frequencies. Uh, let me show you that if we filter out those higher frequencies, it, it looks OK. And if you were to listen to this, it would sound a little tinny. It would sound like an old 8-bit an old video game or something. But you can filter out that tinniness by getting rid of all these extra things. And you'll see we recover a very nice sine wave at the frequency we care about. Let me do that. Let me add in a low pass filter and the plots. And so here, here is the fast sample rate, low pass filtered. And now if I change, if I go up in frequency, let me go up to the point where it used to look pretty crappy. So like there, right? The original samples, they still look kind of crappy. They're still bouncing around. And the stair step version of that also looks kind of crappy. It's still bouncing around. When you low pass filter that, you get out a nice, sine wave at the right frequency. And you can push this all the way all the way up. And the, the, the particular stair steppy pattern means that the amplitude is going to get a little bit lower as you, as you kind of push the bounds here. But you still get a really nice sine wave. And even when the original wave looks super weird, this shows that the, uh, the information is still exactly there. As long as you don't go too high, this crappy samples can be uh, up-sampled up and filtered to look really nice. And this is the first of our models of analog systems. So, so I'm going to talk a lot about analog signals and digital signals. And you can imagine an analog signal doing this not by a factor of 10, but kind of by a factor of infinity. It makes super smooth stair steps, continuous little steps. And then when you filter, uh, the true filter to reconstruct this sine wave happens in, in analog circuits. So there's some resistor and some capacitor. And if you try to charge up the capacitor and discharge it too fast, it can't keep up. And that's, that's what uh, produces this, this analog signal. So, so this will be a model for analog signals. Uh, all right, so let me, let me pause the sampling demo and say that I'm going to show you signals that look kind of crappy. That, that are uh, at, at pretty high sample rates. But keep in mind that the actual analog signal is, is a truly a nice sine wave. Let me say one more thing. All these operations are linear. So what that means is if I have a sampled wave and I, and I add a bunch of sampled waves together, this process of taking each sample and repeating it 10 times or turning it into a continuous step, that's linear. Right? If I have a, a superposition of samples, I'll get a superposition of these steps. And the process of low-pass filtering, although it's not obvious, maybe, uh, that is also linear. If I put a sum of signals into resistor and capacitor circuits, I get a sum of signals out. So just because I'm showing a sine wave, um, it, it doesn't mean that this is the only kind of wave where this works. If I had a smoother, nicer wave, as long as it can be made of sine waves of frequencies less than this maximum frequency, this process of turning it into a, a smooth analog signal is completely linear. All right, so step number two is to show some, some math uh, in terms of sines and cosines. So let me switch to my next graph. Uh, let, me, let me actually pause to ask for questions about, about the sampling. Maybe I'll keep this up while I take questions. Uh, feel free to jump in at any time. I, I'm not going to read the chat, and I'm not going to look at raised hands, because I, you're seeing the screen that I'm seeing. I was surprised that just repeating the samples gave you higher resolution. Um, does, uh, is there any point where that, are, are there any situations where that would fail? So, so repeating the samples 
if you were to work out what does the spectrum of this repeated sample look like? Mm -hmm. It looks like this. There's there's copies of the of the original tone, and they move around in this complicated way. But the fact that the first copy is is exactly um, the the frequency here yeah. means that as long as you can put your low pass filter to to cut out all these higher ones, uh, you can really recover the smooth, nice original version. So um, if you took it, if you took a signal processing class, you, you might have thought that repeating the sample 10 times is not is not the best way to do it. There's a there's a block here that's that does something slightly slightly better. Um, I guess since you asked, I'll I'll enable that. So instead of just repeating it, I'm going to pass it through this this thing here. And what this does is for every sample it just makes a really big uh, 10, 10 times as big sample, and then it just fills in a bunch of zeros. So let me play that. Uh, you can't, can't even see the 10 times as big samples. Uh, is that because, oh, that's because I'm not showing them. That's why. Ah. Okay, let me play that. So this, this might be more closer to what, what you might have learned in a uh, digital signal processing class. This is an even better way to reconstruct the wave. Instead of having little stair step, if you, if you have little spikes and then pass that through a low pass filter, uh, the advantage here is that as I increase the frequency, the, the amplitude doesn't, doesn't die off. It stays, uh, it stays at one. And I can push it pretty, pretty hard right up to the edge and the amplitude will still stay, still stay one. So this is, you know, in, in the analog language, if you had little delta function spikes and then you were to smooth those spikes out, you could perfectly reconstruct any signal, not just a sine wave, any combination of sine waves, as long as they had frequencies below half of your sample rate. And in GNU radio, if you, whenever you plunk down one of these frequency boxes, uh, you tell it the sample rate and it automatically sets the maximum here because uh, a sampled signal can't contain any frequencies above this. If you, if you try to put frequencies above this, they'll actually look exactly like frequencies below it. So, so GNU radio automatically uh, scales, scales the plot to half of the sample rate. And that's true for all of these. It's just here, I've increased the sample rate by quite a bit. And I have a bug here too. I should have said times repeat. I guess originally I repeated a hundred times, but that was, I didn't change my mind about that. Um, yeah. So um, it is. I would say that this is one of the most uh, unintuitive things about digital signal processing is that you can perfectly reconstruct signals, even though the samples look crappy. If you go through this process of turning them into spikes and then low pass filtering the spikes, you get exactly the sampled version of this sinusoid, which is what this calculation is. Sure. All right, so let's talk about sines and cosines for a second. So I'm gonna have two, uh, my, my next couple of graphs are gonna come in pairs. So there's a sine, sine cosine and a complex. And the only difference between these two is I turned everything into a complex number. So let's talk about sines and cosines for a little bit. Uh, oh, sorry, let me walk through what, what we're doing here. So I'm making two signals. Uh, they're both cosines. So here's a signal that's a cosine. Here's a signal that's a cosine. Again, everything's going to be sampled at one mega sample per second. I'm going to throttle them both to one, one mega sample per second. And I'm just going to plot them. That's all I'm doing. I'm just plotting two cosines that I make. And, uh, and I, can have, I have sliders that I, where I can change the frequencies. So I can change the frequency of signal one, it's the blue signal. I can change the frequency of signal two, it's the red signal. And I can change the relative phase between them, although it's a little bit hard to see because the, as time goes on, the relative phase is changing. Unless there are multiple of each other, the relative phase is changing anyway. So um, let me make this 10, 10 and uh, maybe 80. So now the relative phase is fixed as time goes on, but I can change that by sliding the slider. Um, and 
and all I'm plotting here is just the, the frequency components. Now let me show you what happens if I add those two things together. So I'm going to add the red signal to the blue signal, and I'm going to plot the sum. And here's the sum, and it looks a little bit wonky, right? And as I change the relative frequencies, um, it's not obvious by eye that this is just a sum of uh, of two two sine waves. But the frequency plot is just the sum of the original two signals. So this there are two spikes, but it's just the the frequency of this combined signal, and that's because the Fourier transform that, that gives us these frequency plots is, is linear. I add things together here, uh, I'll get the sum of, uh, the sum of what, I, what I've added together. And, and again, I can sort of push this up to be kind of extreme, extremely high frequencies where all the samples look pretty wonky, but the, the spectrum stays pretty reasonable looking. It's just the sum of the, the original two. Uh, hopefully that's not uh, too surprising. Let me show you, let me add in multiplying the two signals together. And this is where things get a little bit more interesting. So uh, let, me, let, me go, let me go to the board for a second before I show this. So um, the, the time plots are gonna look equally complicated, but in order to figure out what's going on, the frequency spectrum is always just plotting the frequencies that you need to sum together to make up the sinusoid, as we saw when we summed the, the things together. So uh, to, to think about this, uh, the, multiple, the, the multiplication, we need to look at trig identities. So cosine of A plus B is, maybe you remember this, cos, cos A, cos b um, minus sine a sine b. Uh, a little bit off the board there. I'll, uh, if I have cos of a minus b, the sign changes here. So cos, it's like changing the sign of b. So cos of a cos b plus, let me switch markers plus sine A, sine B. And now if, if I wanted this, if I wanted the product of two cosines, I could just add these things together and I get uh, cos A plus B plus cos A minus B equals two cos A cos B. All right, I can just divide by two and solve for the product of two cosines is a half of the sum plus a half of the difference. And that's what we'll see when we look at the, when we look at the plots. So let me go back to sharing the screen. Share the desktop, yeah. Nope, share the desktop. Okay, so um, the, the product plot might look equally wonky but if I look at the spectrum here, what I see is I see two spikes and one is at the sum frequency. So this small frequency plus this large frequency gives me that. And one is at the difference. Let me, let me give these uh, kind of reasonable, reasonable numbers here. So maybe call this 20 and 200. All right, so this is 20 and 200 kilohertz. And so the sum frequencies are just at 20 and 200, but the product, I get the sum frequency at 220 and the difference frequency at 180. So whenever you multiply cosines together, you get both the sum and the difference. Um, and we're, we're not going to worry so much about the overall amplitudes, but uh, there's a uh, half of the, half of the power goes into this uh, some frequency and half the power goes into this difference frequency. All right, uh, that's just trig identities. Let me now move on to, uh, let me now move on to 
the complex exponentials. And here's where we're going to finally start thinking in terms of complex complex numbers. So so before I um, I'll erase this. Before I uh, show you the the plots, let me either teach you or remind you how complex exponentials work. Oops. So Euler's you formula. Stop sharing your screen. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'll leave that, I'll leave that up for a little bit. Euler's formula, um, which some of you may have seen, is that e to the i theta is cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. And if, if you've never seen this and you're not convinced that this works, think about the Taylor expansion for e to the i theta. This is just um, a sum from n goes from 0 to infinity of 1 over n factorial uh, theta, theta to the n. Uh, is that right? I, well, i theta to the n. And if you remember what the Taylor expansion for cosine is, it contains only the even terms. And they alternate in sign between positive and negative and positive and negative. If you imagine even, even ends, those will just alternate in sign between positive, negative, positive, negative. And similarly with the sign, the sign contains only odd terms, and they also alternate in sign. And here, all the odd terms are going to be i or negative i. So if you factor out that i, you get you get this uh, this Euler's formula. And I can write e to the minus i theta. Cosine is even, so that's just cosine theta. Sine is odd, so this is minus i sine theta. And if I added these two things together, let me let me do this down here. If I add add these two equations together, I get e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta is two cosine of theta. And if I were to subtract the two, I would get e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta equals, well, it's i minus i. This would be 2i sine theta. So I can use this to solve. Cosine theta is a half e to the plus plus a half e to the minus. And sine of theta is a half e to the plus. Um, uh, sorry, this is over 2i minus a half e to the minus i theta. All right, so a couple of things to note here is that if I write cosine as the sum of complex exponentials, I have a little bit of e to the plus complex angle and the same amount of e to the minus complex angle. If I write sine that way, I also have some amount of e to the plus, and it's, this is purely imaginary. I could multiply top and bottom by i and just get a negative imaginary first term and some amount of e to the minus i. And if I multiply top and bottom of this a half by, by i, I'll, I'll get a, a positive term. So, so both for cosine and sine, there's either equal amounts of positive and negative exponential or equal and opposite amounts of positive and negative exponential. Or said it yet another way, if I have cosines, these, these factors are real and they're the same. And if I have sines, these factors are pure imaginary and they're opposite. So uh, uh, they're, these are complex conjugates of each other. And with cosine, these are also complex conjugates of each other, but that's kind of trivial because they're both real. So we're gonna, we're gonna use these, these facts a little bit when we look at the spectrum of complex numbers. Because what does it mean to take a spectrum of complex numbers? Just like taking a spectrum of a real number, you're asking how much, what is the, how much sine and cosine go into a particular shape? 
where we're taking the spectrum of uh, a complex uh, signal, we're going to ask how much of each complex exponential goes in goes into it. Uh, so let me let me show you that by sharing the screen again and switching over to the complex math. So first, I'll just show you. I have a the two the two complex. Not they, it says cosine, but these are really complex exponentials, throttled, and I'll show you what those look like. Now here it's a little bit more complicated because let me turn one frequency down to zero. So here I'm showing the real and imaginary parts of signal one and the real and imaginary parts of signal two, but I'll get there in a second. So as I increase the frequency, both the real part, which is the blue cosine and the imaginary part, which is the red sine, get uh, increase in frequency, right? Euler's formula says there's a cosine and a, the real part is cosine and the imaginary part is sine. Um, but now you can start to see what negative frequencies mean. Notice that the blue comes first and then the red. If I evaluate this at negative frequencies, the cosine component stays the same, but the sine component switches sine. And now the red comes first and then the blue. So if I take these as a pair, I, I can tell whether my frequency is negative or positive based on uh, whether the real part is leading or the imaginary part is leading. And let me, let me add in a little bit of frequency number two. And now if you look at the, um, the frequency plot, you can see that now the frequencies are both positive and negative. Because now, instead of just having, uh, you know, asking what is the frequency of a cosine or the frequency of a sine, I'm asking what is the coefficient of the either the positive i omega t terms and what is the coefficient of the, the e to the minus i uh, omega t terms. And so I have a single spike that I can, single spike for each one, but that spike can either be on the positive side or the negative side. I can have positive frequencies or negative frequencies. If I just had cosines and I evaluated them since cosine is even, um, I, I would, I only need to, to worry about the, the positive frequencies. Let me do the same thing I did last time and start adding, adding these two together. So nothing changes here. Everything's still just a superposition. So when you add two waves together, the, the real parts add and the imaginary parts add, and you get a complicated uh, complex number. But the, the spectrum is just the same. The spectra is just add. So no matter what I have on top, when I add them together, I get the same thing on the bottom. And that's true whether I have positive frequencies or negative frequencies or slow frequencies or fast frequencies. Uh, and now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what happens when you multiply these two together. And this is actually easier. I don't need to worry about any of the trig identity stuff, right? If I have a signal that is, uh, if I have a signal that is e to the i omega t, and I multiply that signal, so this is a, you know, at a single frequency, omega, omega is always two pi real honest to god frequency in hertz. If I multiply this by i omega prime t, I don't have to do any complicated trig identities. I could just add the exponents together, omega plus omega prime t. So here I just get the sum frequency. I don't, I don't get both the sum and the difference frequencies like I did for, for multiplying two cosines together. So let, me, let me show that. Uh, I'll stop this and add in the multiply. All right, so, so here, what you get out is just a single spike at the sum of these two frequencies. So let me give some more concrete example. Let me make this 40 and let me make this 100. If I look at where this spike is, this should be at 140 kilohertz. Yeah, 140 kilohertz. 
where the spike is. And if I were to make this 300, I get spike at 400. So I'm adding 300 plus 100. So this is why one of the reasons why we end up focusing a lot on complex numbers, because when you multiply signals together, dealing with complex numbers, even though the time plots look more complicated because you have to deal with both the real and the imaginary part. When you think about things in terms of frequency, it's a lot easier. You don't have to worry about trig identities. Things come out much cleaner. So let me uh, let me pause and ask for questions there, and I'll uh, I'll go on to the next next graph if uh, if nobody has questions. So this signal source. Um, even though GNU Radio is saying the waveform is a cosine, it is a complex exponential? Uh, right. So I've chosen its output type to be complex rather than floating point. And my options here are constant, sine or cosine, a square wave, a triangle wave, or a sawtooth wave. So, I'm... you know, these, I would say that this is not the, the cleanest thing, but if you choose cosine or sine, yeah. Um, that makes sense if you have a real source, but if you have a complex source, it just puts out a complex exponential, and you, I guess, you just have to know that. Okay. Um, and yeah, and the frequency is this frequency slider in kilohertz times times a thousand to put it in megahertz, like everything else. All right. Now the next the next three graphs are all going to be. Again, sort of versions of the same thing. There's going to be one real version, which I'll slowly explain, one complex version, which is exactly the same, just with complex numbers. And then the final one is what we really want to get to, which is what, what actually happens in the, in the radio, where there's some more complicated mix of complex and real stuff. So let's, let's save that for later. Let's just uh, go through this bit by bit. So how? How is the screen sharing working? Can you, can you all read this or is it too too small? Do I need to zoom in? It's a little small for me, but I can, it's legible. All right, let me see. Uh, if it's legible, uh, how do I zoom in here? Oh, like that, okay. That's fine. So again, I'll sort of reveal things piece by piece. So now we're gonna start with a different source. It's a noise source. It just makes white Gaussian noise. I'll throttle that because I don't have a real hardware source to throttle it. And then I'll just show it Again, always with time and frequency. So here's a real, a real Gaussian noise source. Um, and the way this works is at every sample, you draw a random number from a Gaussian distribution. And each sample is just completely independent of every other sample. And if you take the frequency spectrum of that, it's completely flat. And here from now on, I'm always going to show the frequency frequency spectrum, both positive and negative. And one thing you'll notice, it might be a little bit hard to see uh, here, but it'll be a little bit more clear in a little bit. This frequency spectrum is symmetric. So any of the random little peaks and spikes are, are symmetric around zero. And that's because we have a real wave. And for any, any real wave, it's either, it's made up of sines and cosines and Remember, for cosines, there's just as much positive stuff as negative stuff. And for sines, there's just as much positive stuff as negative stuff, too. It's just a complex conjugate. And so when we're showing these frequency spectra, it's always the magnitude. The magnitude of the amount of e to the plus i omega t here and the magnitude of the amount of minus e to the minus i omega t. And for a real signal made up of sines and cosines, uh, this is going to be the complex conjugate of that, which its magnitude of the complex conjugate is the same as the magnitude of the original number. So these frequency spectra are symmetric. Um, this isn't quite what we want. We, what we want is we want to simulate a real signal. So um, let me, let me, oh, I wasn't sharing the screen. Let me share the screen again. And in order to simulate a real signal, we don't want pure noise that goes everywhere. What I want to do is I want to low pass filter that noise. So I'm going to enable some sliders and a low-pass filter, and I'm going to show that. Uh, the way I've set up this graph, I actually can I can I just show this, or will it give me an error? That'll give me an error. I also need to enable this. So there'll be a second signal source, which we'll talk about in a second. But I'm going to turn that one off as soon as I play this. 
So let me turn, turn off my second signal source. Okay, so here's what we had before. Uh, white noise, it's white because it's flat. I have low pass filtered that noise. And now when I low pass filter something, it just smooths, smooths everything out. So it gets rid of all the high frequency jitters and it just keeps, uh, keeps the smooth, uh, smooth version. And you can see that the frequency spectra, ignore the green, that's, that's what I'll turn on in a second. Uh, the frequency spectra here is, it only goes out to, to about here. It only goes out to this cutoff frequency. And I can allow more signal through or allow less signal through. And if you look at any, any instant, it's, it's again always symmetric around zero because this is a real signal. And uh, the positive, or positive stuff is just the complex conjugate of the negative stuff. Uh, and and there, with a the low-pass filter, there are two parameters. One is just where do I cut off the, the signal? And the other one is how quick is that transition? So I can make, I can make it a real, real uh, sloppy low-pass filter and the, the cutoff isn't very sharp, or I can make it a really sharp low-pass filter. And uh, you might think, why don't I just make it extremely sharp? Well, that's computationally... Uh, more challenging to make it sharp. It's not more challenging to, to change the cutoff, but the sharper I make the filter, the more computing I need to do. You can see in the time, time signal here, the more high frequencies I let in, the more noisy it seems. Uh, all right. Let me, ah, I didn't want to do that. Let me share the screen again. Let me close this. Now, what I'm going to do next is I am going to multiply this noise source that we just showed by, uh, by a cosine. So let me, let me just, I, I'm just playing the same thing again. So I was showing you uh, turning this cosine off, making it zero frequency. But let's, let's imagine that this noise source, this low pass filter noise source, is, is a signal we care about. So this, you can think about this as an audio signal or maybe a smoothed out digital waveform, some, some digital data that we've smoothed out. It's gonna have some, some, some pattern that looks like this. It's gonna look kind of random-ish, but it's gonna be limited in bandwidth. And what we wanna do is we wanna multiply that. We wanna modulate it by a cosine. And now we're starting to simulate what what a radio transmitter does. So what a radio transmitter does is it takes your, your audio signal or your data and then multiplies it by a really fast cosine. Um, and we'll see that the actual software defined radio transmitters are a little bit more sophisticated, but this is sort of like an old fashioned amplitude modulated signal. You have some, some voice and you're multiplying by a cosine. So let me increase the frequency of that cosine. And you can see in the frequency plot, uh, I've got my, uh, my fake data signal or my fake audio signal, and the cosine is gonna be symmetric around zero, and I can change the frequency of that cosine. That's what I'm gonna do. So let me, let me actually do that. Let me multiply them together and show the result of that multiplication. And Remember that this, now I'm simulating some analog multiplier. And if I change the frequency of that multiplier, what you see at the output, so this is the spectrum of the multiplied signal. This is the time plot of the multiplied signal. You can see that the time plot has kind of a slowly varying envelope plus a quickly varying, uh, quickly varying uh, signal because we're multiplying this fast green thing by this slow blue thing. And if you look at the spectrum of this, what this multiplication is doing is it's taking every single frequency component of this original signal. Every single cosine gets turned into the sum and the difference. And every single sine gets turned into the sum and the difference. So every single frequency that makes up this original signal is going to uh, be turned into the sum and difference frequency. So let me, let me make this a little bit more definite. Let me just call this 200. 
So the, the spectrum of this multiplied modulated signal, this is what's actually transmitted in a AM radio transmitter. And it, it has a copy of this spectrum um, around the modulating cosine wave and a copy of the spectrum down here, uh, just because this is a real signal. Everything is perfectly symmetric around zero. And so all the information is contained just within half of this, right? Because this is already symmetric to begin with. And now I've multiplied it by this cosine. And now we have four copies. We have this positive copy plus the cosine frequency. We have this originally negative copy plus the cosine. And then down here, we have this original positive copy minus the cosine and the original negative copy plus, plus the cosine. So there's actually four, every little spike here that happens to appear, uh, there's going to be four of those down here. So this is the spectrum of our modulated signal. And here, you know, I'm pretending that we're modulating the signal only, only at uh, 200 kilohertz. So this is really low frequency. In, and that's just because I'm simulating it with digital, digital samples, right? With an actual analog signal, if I were to take my voice, which this is not such a bad spectrum for voice, and I wanted to transmit it uh, over the AM bands, I would multiply this by something that looks like about a megahertz. If I wanted to transmit it over the 915 megahertz uh, ISM band that, where we can transmit, this, this multiplication would happen and, and this signal would be now centered around 915 megahertz, you know, much closer to a gigahertz. And that multiplication happens with an analog multiplier, uh, just because the digital multipliers with this high accuracy can't, can't go that fast. So we turn the, the data signal, this blue signal, into a, an analog signal. And then we multiply, we, we generate a really fast radio frequency green signal, and we, we multiply those things together. And you might think it's hard to build a circuit that multiplies two things together. But actually, if you had a, an amplifier and you just change the gain of the amplifier based on the blue signal, as long as you can change the gain of the amplifier fast enough, the result is basically like you're multiplying, you're multiplying this by, by the gain of that. All right, so let's talk about how do you recover the original signal. That's the, that's the next step. So to recover the original signal, um, you, you multiply it again. So let me, let me stop this. Let me go back here and uh, uh, where do I want to write? I will get rid of Euler's formula and write up here. So now I have a signal and I'm multiplied by some fast cosine and in order to recover it, I'm going to multiply by cosine again. And let's just look at what cosine squared looks like just from trig identities. Well, cosine squared is going to be, um, so here's cosine of A times B. If I make A and B the same and I divide everything by two, I'm going to get half cosine of A plus B, which is two theta here, plus half because I've divided by two cosine of a minus b, which is just cosine of zero, which is just one. So, so if I multiply my, my radio frequency by cosine again, and now this is what the, the receiver does, I get back a copy. So, so signal times cosine of, cosine of omega t from the transmitter times cosine of omega t from the receiver if my frequencies are exactly the same, I'm going to get back a half of the original signal plus a signal times a half cosine of two omega t plus a signal at, at a much higher frequency. So let's, let's show that. So here I will I'll take another copy of my cosine. I'm actually going to bump up uh, its amplitude by a factor of two so I can get rid of these halves. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. Am I? 
Okay, I'm going to bump up the. I'm just going to bump up the factor of two. So instead of dealing with uh, half half cosine of the sum and half cosine of the difference, I'm going to uh, get rid of those factors of a half. Um, here I'm going to pass it through a delay block, which I'm not going to delay at all at first. I'll, I'll show you the effect of this delay block. So it's just not delaying it. And then I'll multiply the result of my original multiplication by uh, a copy of the original cosine, just so that everything's at the same frequency. And I'll, I'll show that. OK, so this is, this is now the bottom plot's going to be what the receiver does. So each of these signals gets multiplied by cosine again. And so uh, each of them uh, gets split in the sum and the difference. Or you can think of when I did on the board the trig identities, I have my original signal, which stays around 0, plus uh, a signal at twice the cosine frequency, 2, two omega t. So, uh, so my, my modulating frequency is 100 kilohertz. So I'm going to have a signal uh, around 0 plus a signal around 200 kilohertz. And because everything's real, I'm going to have a symmetric spectrum. And now the question is, what happens when I want to recover my original signal? Well, I have, I have my original signal plus this thing at uh, twice the frequency. And what I can do is I can just low pass filter and recover the original signal. And remember that uh, these radios, this, this frequency is really fast, you know, many megahertz, gigahertz. And so it's pretty easy to low pass filter that. So let me show you that. Share the screen again. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this result of the second multiply, low pass filter it, and show it. And not only am I going to show it, I'm going to compare it to a delayed version of my original low pass filtered signal. So this is like the, the audio waveform or the, the fake data. And the reason why I need to delay it is all this processing takes a little bit of time and there's, there's some lag. And so if I really want the signals to be on top of each other, I have to delay it a little bit. So let me show you. Uh, which term are you pass low passing out? Which term am I low passing out? Well, I'm, I'm low passing, uh, I'm low pass filtering this whole signal. And this is made up of stuff around zero plus stuff at twice the twice the carrier frequency. So what's transmitted over the air is centered around 100 kilohertz in this example. And after I after the receiver does a second multiply, I, I get stuff back around 0, which, which was there was nothing at 0 transmitted through the air. And I get stuff at twice the carrier frequency. So let me go back here. So I get this. This is the signal, the original signal that's centered around 0. And this is the new signal. Uh, the stuff I don't want that's centered around twice the twice the carrier frequency. So, so here I'm just showing a one-sided spectrum again. Um, I'm not sure why. Let me let me show a two-sided spectrum. So. When I pass this through the low-pass filter, it keeps the stuff around zero, and it gets rid of this this term that I don't want, the stuff that's at uh, at higher frequency. As long as there's some gap here, which there definitely is, if this is centered around 915 megahertz instead of my example, um, it'll just keep the original signal. And here you can see I'm plotting the original signal in blue and the the demodulated output, the final signal in red, and they're they're basically right on top of each other. Um, the only difference is there's mathematically they should be identical, except there's some numerical rounding, and there's also the low pass filter isn't absolutely perfect. So, uh, so they're ever so slightly different. But I've, we've recovered the original signal. And so this is all a simulation of what happens over the air. So in the radio, there's some analog fast waveform and some digital slow waveform that's been converted into analog. And these are multiplied together to give us this transmitted waveform whose spectrum looks like this. And then on the receiver, 
we do another analog multiply by a super fast, you know, say 915 megahertz signal, and we get this waveform, which you could sort of see has a bunch of positive spikes, negative spikes, positive spikes, negative spikes. Um, and then when we low pass filter this signal, the positive spikes become positive humps and the negative spikes become negative humps. And it's hard to see what's going on in, in the time plots, but it's sort of easy to see what's going on in the frequency plots. Multiplying by cosines just takes each of these things and centers them around the new, uh, around the new cosine. And then when you low pass filter away, you get back the original signal. And in the time domain, you can think about it as smoothing out all these positive and negative spikes. Uh, so there's a disadvantage to this, this system. So this is kind of how AM radio works. This is one way of tuning in AM radio. There's a disadvantage. If, you're, if your receiver is not exactly the same frequency or the same phase as your transmitter, you get some pretty, pretty ugly results. So let me let me sort of do a let me show you that. Let me go to a much narrower signal so I can go a little bit slower with this one. So I've just made everything a little bit narrower. And now you could see what I'm getting out is, is much slower. But let me just phase shift the uh, original signal. Let me, well, let me show you what I'm what I'm varying. So the, the knob I'm going to vary is, is this one. So the transmitter is multiplying by this cosine. And this is looking at the transmitted signal. The receiver is multiplying by the cosine again. And so far, I've, I've done nothing. I've just increased its amplitude a little bit so that I could compare the input and the output. But now I'm going to delay this, this receiver's modulated wave a little bit. And uh, let me go. Back to 50 and 20 here to see that effect a little bit more cleanly. So let me phase shift this by frequency step. So if you're phase shifted by a little bit, it doesn't make much of a difference. But eventually, if you if you phase shift enough, if you phase shift a quarter of a cycle, you're you're multiplying not you're not getting cosine squared, you're getting cosine times sine. And that, when you low pass filter, there is no low frequency content to the signal. Right? And in fact, you can even see this. If I, if I set the phase shift correctly, the low, the low frequency content of the signal disappears. So if my phase of my receiver isn't perfect, I'm never going to get anything. I'm just going to get a flat line. Or uh, let me just say, if my phase is off by an unfortunate amount, I'm going to get a flat line. And if I'm off by uh, by a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm going to get something that's that's not that's not quite not quite right. So this is the disadvantage of this of this real real receiver. So let me talk. Let, let me skip to the next section, which is just doing all this stuff with complex numbers. And you might think this is more complicated because complex numbers are more complicated, but really, conceptually, it, uh, uh, mathematically, it ends up being a little bit simpler. So let me do the same set of steps here. I have white, white Gaussian noise, but here I'm picking a random sample, uh, both for the real part and the complex part. And if you look at the spectrum here, it's no longer symmetric. I no longer have uh, a real signal, so there's not a complex conjugate amount of positive frequency stuff and negative frequency stuff. So that's how you can tell you've got a complex signal is the frequency spectrum is not symmetric. Let me add in um, a low pass filter again. Let me turn this uh, down to zero. So now I have a low pass filtered version of my, my real signal in blue. I also have a low pass filtered version of my imaginary signal in red. And again, these started out totally independent of each other and they're still totally independent of each other. And I, I have a, a low pass filtered version of, of the frequency spectrum. So I'm just taking my white noise and I'm cutting it off. I can change that cutoff. One thing you'll notice is because I'm dealing with complex numbers, the, 
the positive frequency stuff is no longer the complex conjugate of the negative frequency stuff. And when I multiply it, I'm going to multiply now, not by a real signal, but by a complex signal whose frequency can either be positive, so that's the green spike here, or it could be negative. I'm going to multiply by e to the i omega t, and omega can be positive or negative. And let me do that. So I'm just going to enable the multiply block. So this is what the this is what a transmitter would do if if it could transmit complex numbers. And um, what you see coming out is is very simple. I just have uh, a little spectrum around zero. It's not symmetric, and I multiply by e to the i omega t. And just because complex numbers when you multiply complex numbers, you, when you multiply two complex numbers, you just get the sum of the frequencies. That's pretty simple. Um, we get uh, just a single, uh, a single copy of the original spectrum shifted over. And I could shift it positive or I could shift it negative. Mm -hmm. Depends on whether I multiply by a complex number with a positive sign or a complex number with a negative sign. And to, to demodulate it, remember here, here I had my signal times cosine times cosine. I'm going to have my signal times e to the plus i omega t. And to demodulate it, all I need to do is multiply by e to the minus i omega t. And this just gives me back my original signal. There's none of this higher frequency extra stuff that I have to worry about. And let me show that. Oops. I might hit the wrong button. Show that. So to demodulate it, I'm going to take the complex conjugate. So now I have e to the minus i omega t. I'm going to delay it by nothing at first. I'm going to multiply. And I'm going to show that. And so now, now I get back uh, a, a spectrum centered around zero. So no matter where the original one is, after I've multiplied by e to the i omega t and e to the minus i omega t, I get back the original. Now, just to make the, the graphs uh, more parallel, I will low-pass filter anyway, even though this low-pass filter isn't doing anything. And I'll show the result of the low-pass filter along with a copy of the original delayed by some amount that I've experimentally determined based on the processing. And let me scroll to the bottom here. Yeah, so what you see is you see the, um, let me zoom in on this plot a little bit. You see the original signal in red and blue, real and imaginary parts, and you see the complex signal in green and black. And they, they're pretty, pretty similar, they pretty much overlap. This process really does recover the original signal. And here, you can see if I do the same phase shifting trick, let me uh, switch back to the narrower signal and less dramatic modulation. Zoom in. If I do the same phase shifting trick, I don't lose the, I never lose the signal. So as I phase shift, the signals no longer match, but at the place where I used to lose it, what you see is that the blue is now exactly the same as the green. Uh, sorry, the blue is now the same as the black. So the real input became the imaginary output. And although it's a little bit hard to see, let me, let me see if I can stop it. Yeah, and what you see is that the... Uh, the, the blue and the black match. So the real input now looks like the imaginary output. And the other po components are still there. They're just inverted in, in sign, S-I-G-N. Let me play that again. And if I keep phase shifting, all the information is always there. If I'm exactly there, let me pause it. Uh, well, I want to be exactly at 10. 
So if I'm exactly off by half a cycle, nice. um, you can see that both both get inverted. But all the information is still there, no matter no matter how I uh, no matter how I do it. So my my oscillator doesn't have to be exactly right. I can be off by a little bit in phase, and I can still recover the signal. There's no point where the output just disappears. It just sort of sl sloshes back and forth between uh, being in the real and being in the imaginary part. All right, and I am a little bit over on the time I promised, but we've we've only got one graph left, and this is a mix of the previous two graphs. So, so this is what the actual radio does. And uh, let me start the graph the same way. So starting the graph, it looks exactly like the start of the complex graph. So I have my same noise source, throttled it. I low pass filter that noise source. I'm gonna show that along with my signals. The first part of this, uh, what the real thing does uh, is, is identical. Now, this is the actual radio is kind of the best, the best of both worlds, or at least the, the best and worst of both worlds. So we want to have the nice advantages of the complex signal. But at the end of the day, the thing that's transmitted over the air is a real signal. So how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, let me show you what's actually transmitted over the air. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about what's what's going on. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to have our original signal, which I'm going to call, let's say, z equals x plus i y. Right, there's some, some signal for x, which is the real part, and some signal for y, which is the imaginary part. And what I want is I want to multiply z by e to the i omega t. And this, this, would, this would be ideal. Let, let me just do this out. So this is uh, x, uh, x plus i y times cosine plus i sine. So, so this is what the complex modulation is doing. It's multiplying these two things together. So here I'm going to get a bunch of terms. So I'm going to get x cosine omega t. Let's just consider the real terms first. So the, there's a real term there and a real term there, minus y sine omega t. And let's consider what, what are the imaginary terms. So there's plus i times x sine omega t, right, uh, plus y cosine omega t. So the result of this product is, is complex. It has a real part and an imaginary part. And what I'm actually going to transmit over the air is just this real signal, just this real part. That's, that's what the, the software defined radio is going to transmit. So I give it complex samples. And the actual thing that goes over the air is just the real part of this product. And now let me show you, show you what that looks like. Uh, okay, let me close that. All right, so, so how do I get this? Well, I'm gonna have my signal source, which is, it's a complex output, it's blue, so it's complex. Um, so this is e to the i omega t, which is cosine plus i sine. Um, I have to convert my low pass signal into x and y. So the real part is x, the imaginary part is y. I have to convert my, my uh, complex exponential into a real and imaginary part, cosine and sine. And the next couple steps, the next three steps, are going to compute the thing I just wrote on the board and circled. So 
So this is x times cosine, right? It's x at this input and cosine at the other input. And the bottom multiply is going to be y times sine. So it's y times sine. And then I'm going to subtract the two. And that's going to give me the thing I circled. And I'm going to show that. So now, notice that everything's orange. So everything's a real number. The, the imaginary components are, are real numbers. And these multiplies are real multiplies. So this can actually happen with a real, um, uh, a real analog multiplier, right? So the where do the analog to digital conversions take place? Well, sort of here it takes the 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 transmitter takes this complex number and converts the real parts into an analog wave, and it converts the imaginary parts into analog wave. And the transmitter also has. I'm cheating here a little bit. The transmitter has an oscillator that spits out a sine and a cosine. So you imagine it, it's an oscillator that's going at 915 megahertz, but it, it has a cosine at 915 megahertz and a sine at 915 megahertz. And these multipliers are analog multipliers as an analog subtractor. And this produces the signal that I circled, which I'll show right here. All right, so, so here's, here's the signal. And uh, what, what is this? Well, this is as if you had taken this original signal and multiplied it by the complex number, which is what we did, we multiplied by the complex number, that would be shifting it up to be around, around this spike, right? But because we took the real part, we just turn all this information here into uh, this plus its complex conjugate. So, so taking the real part of a number, let me just write that here. Maybe taking, you have a complex number like Z, taking the real part of Z, a real part of Z. Well, we know that the answer is gonna be X, but one way you can compute this is you can compute this as Z plus the complex conjugate of Z. Right, and this is just X plus IY plus X minus IY, the, the Y's cancel and we just are left with the real part X. And twice this is a linear, x. sorry, go ahead. It's twice x, right? Twice x, yeah, sorry, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm being pretty sloppy about overall factors mm -hmm. here, uh, mostly because when you transmit over the air, it gets reduced by some enormous factor uh, yeah. where, where factors of two are not gonna matter too much when you're getting reduced by factors of uh, you know, millions. Um, yeah, so, so let me share the screen again. Taking the real part is a linear operation. It, I am adding what would be just this spike. I'm adding the complex conjugate of this spike. And so uh, that's what gives me this term here. And so what's actually transmitted over the air is looks like this. It, it's um, a real signal and it contains all the information that's in this original uh, complex frequency spectrum. It contains all the, and, and notice that it's not symmetric, it contains both the information from the real parts and the imaginary parts. And this thing up here is no longer symmetric. Uh, it, it has different information on, on the side above my, uh, my modulating frequency and the side below. And then this whole thing gets mirrored because at the end of the day, this is a real signal. And so the signal that gets transmitted over the air, oops, that's not what I want. The signal that gets transmitted over the air, the thing that I've circled here, contains both the X information and the Y information, just separated by, uh, one gets multiplied by cosine terms and one gets multiplied by sine terms. All right, now how do we, how do we demodulate? How do we get back the original, the original signal? Uh, so to do that, uh, we are going to take this thing, let me call this thing that I've circled, let me call just this thing I've circled S. This is the signal that actually gets transmitted over the air. And let me show you how we're gonna get back the original signal. So 
the, the receiver is going to take S. And one thing it's going to do is it's going to multiply this by uh, 2, just to make the, the factors work out, cosine of omega t and sine of omega t. Actually, let's, let's do sine of minus omega t. So this is simulating multiplying, simulating this process. It's simulating multiplying the signal. Uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't have called this S. Let me call this T, because this is what's being transmitted. Uh, yeah, call this T. This is what's transmitted. So simulating this process, it's taking the, the modulated signal, or the real part of this, and multiplying by e to the minus omega t. It's the same as taking the transmitted signal and uh, multiplying it by uh, by this. Now let me let me write what this is. So this t is this complicated thing involving both sines and cosines and x's and y's. And if you if you do this multiplication out and you use trig identities, what you get out is you get x plus a couple terms, so x cosine of 2 omega t minus y cosine of 2 omega t. And the second term, and, and, and what's nice about this is these are, this multiply happens analog. And this, remember, this frequency is like 950 megahertz. So you get back the original signal plus these, these terms, both of which have extremely high frequency content, like whatever, you know, 1.8 gigahertz or something. And that's easy to low pass filter out and you get back the original. So, and this one here is gonna be after some trig identities, Y plus stuff that's at twice the frequency. Let me write it as minus Y cosine of two omega T um, minus X sine of two omega t. I didn't leave myself much room here. Two omega t. All right, so again, uh, we will filter out all the super high frequency stuff and we will get back our original signal. And so the receiver software defined radio also has a local cosine oscillator and a local sine oscillator that it does this analog multiply and, and low pass filter and we get back our original X and Y. So let me show you that. Share screen. Okay. So here I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, so this is the, I've converted my uh, original complex exponential just a cosine and a sine oscillator. I'm gonna take the cosine and multiply by two, take the sine and multiply by two, just uh, to get this times two cosine times two sine, I'm gonna. This is this was the transmitted signal, so I'm gonna multiply the the transmitted signal by the cosine that I just made, and multiply the transmitted signal by the sine I just made, and this gives me what I just wrote on the board: x plus x times this higher frequency stuff and y minus higher frequency stuff. I'm gonna show that. So what does that look like? So that's this here. So here, um, I, I have my two terms. One I'm gonna call my demodulated real signal and one my demodulated imaginary signal. And the frequency spectrum of the real and the imaginary signal well, each of them individually is symmetric because these are both just real signals that I actually have as some two, you know, two different analog waveforms. So, so each of these is symmetric. The red and, and the blue is symmetric. And they have the original X content and the original Y content down here. And they also have the super high frequency stuff, which we can filter out. And that's what we're going to do in the next step. We're going to filter out that stuff. So my... Uh, uh, my first signal, I'm going to, this is an analog filter. I'm going to filter out the, the, the frequency just to get back X and filter out the frequency just to get back Y. Uh, 
And now in order to compare it to the original signal, I have to take my, I have to sample it with a analog to digital converter and report back to the computer just the complex number X plus IY. And that's what I'm gonna to compare to my original signal. I'm gonna plot that and plot a delayed version of the original signal just for comparison. So this, this part is the, you know, you can think of this as the analog to digital converter and then the, the software defined radio reports complex numbers, X and X and Y. So what does that look like? Well, if everything went smoothly, then my, uh, my real and imaginary input signals should match my real and imaginary demodulated signals. And the spectrum of this demodulated signal should match the original spectrum of my, uh, my input, you know, my, my two independent channels. You can think of this as like a, a stereo, stereo sound left and right, or just two completely independent smoothed out data streams. And that's, that's what I get out. Uh, so that, that is how, that is how uh, the software defined radio works to transmit a real signal over the air that has content around the, the frequency you're interested in and a not, not symmetric content because, uh, because we've, we have uh, both a real and imaginary part. And then the, the way the receiver works to take this little chunk of spectrum here and move it down to be centered around zero as a bunch of samples of complex numbers. And you know this in it in our examples, this is not centered around 200 kilohertz or something. It's centered around 915 megahertz, you know, around a gigahertz. And and then you're, you're taking a little chunk of spectrum around a gigahertz and translating it down to uh, positive and negative spectra around zero. And then the digital to analog or analog digital converters are sampling that and reporting that. So, so you're really, you know, here, here we only imagine transmitting one, one little chunk of spectrum, but you can imagine if a whole bunch of transmitters were operating on a whole bunch of different frequencies uh, all next to each other, what the software defined radio does is it picks out one little range and translates it down to being around zero. And the same low pass filters that filter out all this stuff filter out all the other adjacent channels. And you're just taking a little chunk of spectrum around where you're interested in, around say 950 megahertz and translating it down to, to be slow enough to actually uh, do digital, uh, analog to digital conversion. All right, so um, I think that was a lot, but I will upload all of these um, all of these flow graphs, uh, and I'm going to upload the video so you can you can play with them. Uh, but you know, hopefully, if you've seen some of this Fourier transform stuff before, uh, this kind of symmetry properties of pure real signals versus complex signals should be a little bit of review. And if not, it'll be motivation for when you do take Fourier transform classes to to eventually learn learn all those uh, properties. So let me ask, I, I know I went a little bit over where, where I meant to go, but are, uh, do any of you have any questions about, uh, about this stuff or is it all just kind of too much too, too fast? Um, I have a lot of questions that will hopefully be answered by learning more about Fourier transforms and all that, yeah. Yeah, I sort of stated a lot of things about this frequency spectrum without without proof. I think the overall like concept of the SGR thing, like the thing you said at the end makes sense though, uh, which is, which is. I have a quick question. It's why are we, why is the SGR transmitting both the cosine and the sine over there? Cause couldn't it technically just transmit the cosine and then like make the sine from that? Cause it's, 
cosine theta plus i sine theta. Uh, oh, hold on. Let me. Or omega, I mean. So, so um, I, your, your question is good, but I, I'm not, yeah. I want to answer exactly what you asked. So, okay. so this thing that I've circled, that's what it transmits. Right. And this contains both x information and y information. You're asking why do we need the y information? Why couldn't we just transmit the x? Yeah, because isn't the y, I could be mistaken, but isn't the y the same amplitude as the x? Uh, no, so let me show you what x oh. and y are. Let me, uh, so, so x and y are, are these signals here, this red and blue, you know, you can think of it as like a left audio channel and a right audio channel or something. They, they can be totally independent of each other. Okay. So I just, you know, the way this works, I literally just pick random numbers independent for, for the real parts and the imaginary parts. And then when you low pass filter, you get these blobby waveforms that, that are just totally independent. So, so it's true that the, the SDR could just transmit the, the blue and not, not transmit the red, but you're kind of wasting wasting half of the spectrum. Okay. So if we did that, we would be kind of back to the, the, the example I gave of the real, the real AM modulator. Yeah. So, so if we did that, this, the thing we would be transmitting would be basically just like a real signal. This spectrum would be symmetric, which means yeah. that the spectrum up here would be symmetric or we're kind of wasting, wasting oh. half of the spectrum. Okay, not so this is- having both of those things. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. So it, it is actually, so we can use the other part of the spectrum. Uh, yeah. So, so instead of having a redundant, redundant mirrored copies on either side of 950 megahertz by transmitting both the, the, uh, real and imaginary parts, transmitting both the sine and the cosine pieces, uh, we have non-redundant, non-mirrored parts of the spectrum. All right, that makes sense. So when you tune to 915 megahertz, the, the two sides can have independent information. Okay, that makes sense. And what, what I'm not really able to show you is that uh, this has the same nice property where if, if your receiver is a little bit off, all that happens is kind of information sloshes back and forth between the real and the imaginary part of, of the demodulated output. So, so you, it, like you can correct it without losing any signal. Whereas if okay. you just did everything purely real and didn't, didn't do this trick, uh, then if, if your oscillator was off by a little bit, even off in phase, which you have no control over, um, it would, uh, it, sometimes you would just receive zero. That, that would be bad. But here you always receive something. It just, the input real and imaginary parts might get multiplied by some e to the i theta, which then mix mix the uh, mix those into the the received signals. Or, okay. Yeah, they, they mix them into different combinations in the received signals. But you can recover that. You you you're never in a unlucky situation where you're uh, where you receive zero power. All right, that makes sense. Awesome. Why did we call this zero IF modulation? Ah, uh, that's a good question. So yes, this whole process is called zero intermediate frequency modulation. And the idea is that um, you are, so, um, how do I wanna say this? His historically, the way that a lot of radios work is you, you modulate by, by multiplying by a cosine of a certain frequency and it translates the whole spectrum up to being centered around that, that frequency. So in AM radio, you know, your AM station is about a megahertz and multiplies your audio by about a megahertz and translates it up to being centered around a megahertz. Um, in some types of receivers, you, you don't recover that signal by multiplying by a cosine of the same frequency. 
you multiply by uh, a different frequency to translate that spectrum down to some intermediate frequency. Often, oftentimes it's in between the, sure. the high radio frequency and the audio frequency. It's some, somewhere in between. But it's, it's fixed. As you, as you tune to different stations, the first multiplier always multiplies the, the radio frequency spectrum down to, to be at some fixed intermediate frequency. And that allowed, allowed you to have nice, high quality analog filters that were really optimized to filter really well around a particular intermediate frequency. Okay. The reason why this is called zero intermediate frequency is because we're, we're taking the radio frequency spectrum and we're shifting it all the way down to be centered around zero. Right. So I don't know why it's called no intermediate frequency, but it, it's called zero intermediate frequency instead. Um, because the first the first multiply shifts it all the way down uh, to being centered around zero. That's neat. That's kind of crazy that you can take a complex signal, kind of compress it into a real signal, and then get it all back. Uh yes, it's very interesting. And let me, you're not you're not cheating. And the reason you're not cheating is because. Um, uh, a true real signal. So, so let me, maybe this is the best example of that. If I zoom in on, on here, I'm showing two spectra. One Please is- Please share your screen. Oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, let me zoom out before I share so you know what I zoomed in on. Thanks. So uh, let me zoom in on here because here we have spectra of two different real signals. So before, before I low pass filter and turn them into a complex signal, uh, let me, how do I wanna zoom in like that? I have a spectrum of my X, the blue, and I have a spectrum of my Y, the red. And these are, X and Y are themselves real signals. And so this, this frequency spectrum is symmetric. So all of the information for X is contained in just half of this, and all the information for Y is contained in half of this. And now when I, when I turn them into a complex number by taking X plus IY, the spectrum is no longer symmetric, but uh, it's, it's a single spectrum, but now it's not symmetric. So um, I haven't really, I haven't really cheated. I've just gotten rid of some of the redundancy. So if I have a real signal, it would be symmetric. Yeah. And, and I would be kind of wasting half of this. That, that's what happened when I, when I did the example with the real modulator, like the AM modulator. In fact, AM signals are, are inefficient. If, if, you, if you tune your software-defined radio to be around an AM radio station, you'll see that it's perfectly symmetric. Uh, and, and they're just wasting half of the spectrum. But you know, back in the day, it was easy to make and, and receive AM. Uh, and so it's okay that they were a little bit wasteful. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really neat trick, but we're not, we're not really getting something for nothing. All right, awesome. Any last minute questions? Sorry, I've kept, I've kept you for, for so long. I, I guess I should have expected that this would uh, take longer, but I ended up doing a bit more in the way of trig identities than I originally planned. Other, other questions? Everyone's hungry and or tired? Thank you. I guess I should apologize for uh, showing up 46 minutes late. Oh, no, that's fine. Sorry about uh, that. This is all being recorded, and uh, I will upload the video <laughs> and share it. All right. All right, awesome. Okay, uh, thank you all. Um, let me...